So thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, and thank you to the people who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesby, and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, our program this evening will look at the history of Boston's Harbor Islands. Uh, while some of the islands are ragged rocks teeming with coastal wildlife, uh, others resemble manicured parks, largely ignored by historians and previously home to prisons, asylums, and sewage treatment plants, at least one sewage treatment plant, which is still there. These surprisingly diverse and symbol of islands have existed quietly on the urban fringe uh, over the last four centuries. Uh, drawing on archival sources, historic maps and photographs, and diaries from island residents, the book Urban Archipelago attests that the Harbor Island story is central to understanding the ways in which Boston has both shaped and been shaped by its environment over time. Our speaker this evening is Pavla Shimkova. Uh, she is a historian with an interest in Central European and American environmental history. She is a postdoctoral researcher in the project Corridor Talk, Conservation Humanities and the Future of Europe's National Parks. Um, within this project, she focuses on the transnational environmental history of the Bavarian forest. Uh, she studied American cultural history, English literature, and political science at Muzarik University in the Czech Republic uh, and at LMU Munich, where she received her doctorate. She worked as a research associate at the Rachel Carson Center from uh, 2012 until 2018. I think, as you may notice by my very bad pronunciation, uh, she has also traveled a great distance to be with us, uh, coming all the way from, from Germany. Um, so uh, I apologize for my mispronunciation of, of German words. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to mention that the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, hosts about uh, 60 original programs on all aspects of American history, uh, as well as 35 seminars and teacher workshops every year. Uh, most of these are free uh, or have a very moderate cost. Um, uh, however, we're only able to do this thanks to the support of our members and donors. If you enjoy the fact that we host talks like this, uh, we hope that you will become a member or donate uh, to our annual fund. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome our speaker to the stage. Okay. Uh, also from me, good evening and, and uh, hello to everyone here and also online. And um, I just say that I'm really glad to be here in person. <laughs> Uh, as Gavin just said, I came over from Germany, which is a small miracle in itself these days. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, the Massachusetts Historical Society, uh, for having me, especially uh, given and Olivia for, for arranging this talk. And also, thank you so much for, for, for coming to this talk. And I'm so glad to see so many friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. Uh, organized or not. <laughs> um, so tonight I will speak about my book, Urban Archipelago, uh, an environmental history of the Boston Harbor Islands. And um, it was just uh, published by the University of Massachusetts Press several weeks ago. And um, just by looking at the cover of my book, uh, you may have a few questions. And the first question you're probably asking yourselves is, so how come that someone who's, I mean, you're hearing me speak, so you know I'm not from Boston, <laughs> uh, the United States either. So, so how come that someone who doesn't have any personal ties to Boston writes a book about the Boston Hub Islands? And the answer is that at the beginning was just simple curiosity, basically. Uh, because I came to Boston the first time in 2015 and because of a different project. And then I started seeing all these, uh, I, I came across these, these newspaper stories about Spectacle Island, which at that time uh, was like 10 years prior, uh, had, this, had, this, uh, had this tremendous makeover uh, from a landfill into a park. Um, and you're all familiar with these pictures, but uh, just, just as a reminder, so this is spectacle uh, as a landfill in the 1950s. Um, this is spectacle during the reconstruction in the 1990s. 
it's a few years later. And most of you, most of you are familiar with this. So, and this is so, 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 I mean, the, the visitor center is still missing, but basically, it's, and, and the trees are small, but basically this is spectacle as it looks now. So I became intrigued by this story because there was so much to unravel. There was, so there, was the, there was the question of how did this island become a landfill in the first place? Like, why did anyone think it was a good idea to put a landfill on an island? And how did it happen that the perception of this island changed so much that the city and the state were not willing to, to, to invest millions of dollars to, to convert it into a park? And also, why did the reconstructed island look the way it did? Uh, so basically, what does nature look like if we get to build it ourselves? Uh, once I started looking, there were hundreds of newspaper stories about this. And I was wondering, why does everyone care so much about this little island? Why is it so interesting? So, so I became intrigued, and so these were the questions that sparked my interest, and uh, this book is, is the result of this interest. Which leads me to a second question. I don't have to explain to the people in the room because you're interested in Boston Harbor Islands anyway, but uh, the question would be, why even write the history of the Boston Harbor Islands? Because when you look at them from Boston, they seem pretty marginal and, and hardly connected to the city at all. Um, at first, they're just a handful of, of very small islands in Boston Harbor. For most people, they're probably just recreational spots uh, where one goes to have a Sunday picnic. So, I mean, can their history be in any way significant? Can these places tell us anything that we didn't know before? And in my book, I argue they can. Because uh, the history tells us not only about uh, how Bostonians perceived and used this, this very specific part of their environment, uh, they tell us a lot about Boston itself. And um, this, this is a picture of, uh, you all recognize this. This is this is Boston skyline from Spectacle Island. This is a picture I took, uh, I think, five years ago. And this, uh, shows what what I what I'm getting at. Because if you look at the center, which in this case is the city, from the periphery, then you can you may, you may notice things that you wouldn't notice otherwise. Uh, so the islands, in a way, can tell us a lot about Boston itself, about its changing values, its changing demands, and its changing perception and treatment of its environment. And now for the third question that might arise when you look at the cover is, why call a book about the Boston Harbor Islands urban archipelago, because, I mean, into the islands, most of you probably, and uh, the islands don't look very urban at all. They, it's like some of them are very park-like, uh, others like, like the Brewsters look, look like wild nature, really. So, and they all seem absolutely separate from the city. So, plus, urban archipelago or urban islands somehow seems to be a contradiction in, in itself because when we think of islands we tend to think about uh, places that are somehow there there's there's a very specific imagery uh, hmm, attached to, to a place that's an island we tend to think of faraway places of places that are remote that are isolated uh, this is this, this is standard Western cultural imagery, like think Robinson Crusoe, 
thing, Treasure Island. <laughs> so, it's not the friends of the Boston Harbor Islands, but this is what most people associate with an island. Uh, so the traditional image of an island is not as part of a city. But as I show in my book, if you look at the history of the Boston Harbor Islands, realize that they have in fact been part of Boston ever since Boston was founded. And they have catered sort of to the city's changing needs for the past 400 years. Sometimes they were Boston's dumping ground, receiving materials that the city wanted out of the way. Uh, at other times, they were sort of a magic box of supplying or providing the city with uh, things that it lacked, like nature and open space. But they have been almost at all times embedded into Boston's urban fabric. So most, so I, I would argue that uh, most of the things that happened on the islands were in some way connected to the city. So what I'd like to do now in the sort of the minutes that I have is take you on a short tour through the 400 years of Boston's and the Boston Harbor Islands shared history. And since it's uh, hard, not to mention that, probably impossible to squeeze a book into 30 minutes. And even if I could do that, I mean, if I could do that, I wouldn't have had to write a book. <laughs> So I've chosen several images from, from uh, different historical periods and these images and the stories behind them, uh, I hope will highlight the changing relationship between Boston and its Harbor Island. So the first image I wanna show you is this one. Um, it's, as yeah, most of you can probably see, it's a naval chart. And it's a naval chart from 1688. So it's one of the first known depictions of Boston Harbor. It's sort of turned on its head. So, so north is, uh, from your perspective, to the, to the right. And, and Boston is right here. Orchester. So you get the idea. Um, so this this chart was commissioned by the uh, by by Edmund Andrews, the, the English governor of New England. Uh, and you will notice how strange this chart looks to our contemporary eyes. Because this red line here, that's the coast, obviously. And you'll notice how empty the mainland is. Because the person who drew the map and the people who commissioned the map just didn't care what's on the mainland because it wasn't interesting. And there was a reason for that. And like the mainland's empty, but on the other hand, you can see how detailed the depiction, like the representation of the harbor is. So there's everything, there's, there's the channels, uh, there's the depth of the channels, uh, and there's all sorts of navigation hazards mm, described on this map. So it's shows and submerged rocks and everything. Uh, and this that the colonial administration had uh, and the English settlers of the 17th century had of Boston's environment, because the mainland at this point wasn't really interesting to them. The mainland. Uh, had no roads, you couldn't travel on it, it was marshy, it was, it was hard, even impossible to penetrate. Um, on the other hand, it was water that provided access, not only, <clears throat> not only contact among the colonies themselves, but also between the colonies in England. So in this early period, waterways acted as roads and they made movement of goods and people possible they were a connection rather than a separation or an interval between places. Um, so in a way, Boston Harbor at this point was a, was a, was a, was a, was a highway leading to Boston 
and the Boston Harbor Islands for sort of signposts and windbreaks along that highway. Period, so mainly the, in the 17th century, was the only time in Boston's history when the Boston Harbor Islands were not, not only used as an integral part of town, but were also seen as such by Bostonians. As you all know, Boston was founded in 1630, and already a year later, in 1631, uh, the Code of Assistance, the colonist governing body, uh, is issued an order that made the Harbor Islands a common property of the people uh, of Boston. And given how water provided access, and the islands were among the most accessible parts. Uh, um, and they were used for the resources. So Bostonians would fetch uh, timber and building stone from these islands, and they would use them as, as pasture land, as is evidenced by their names. Uh, Boston Harbor not only contains a calf island, uh, but also two hog islands, which today are called different names. One of them is, uh, has been known as Noddles Island, and that's what East Boston today stands on. And the other one uh, is today known as Spinnaker Island of Hull, which has this condo on it. <laughs> yeah, apparently, yeah, Hog Island's not as attractive. <laughs> and so, so uh, these uses, of course, also had an effect on the island's environment. Uh, the wood and gravel harvesting uh, left these islands exposed to erosion. And they reduced several of them to well, not much more than shows. And a case in point here is Nix's mate. You all know, I mean, this, this, is the, this is the beacon. And today, it's only visible at low tide. But in the 1630s, it was reportedly an island of 12 acres. So Nix's mate. Uh, pay the price for, for Boston's uh, hunger for, for, for building stone and gravel. But this intensive use can also be read as evidence uh, that Boston started out as really an island town, as, as, as I hope both, as, especially this chart vividly shows. We fast forward. Um, the image is from the early 20th century, but the phenomenon it relates to goes back to the 19th century. And Kate Rivera, who, is, <laughs> who I'm glad to, to, to see here, will, 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 will recognize this because this, uh, this is the garbage reduction plant on the Spectacle Island. Uh, so this plant operated uh, on Spectacle from 1903 until 1935 and received garbage from Boston. The garbage was transported on, on, on scows, so little boats, to the island and the factory extracted grease from the garbage by heating and would deposit the dry residue on the island. But the garbage reduction plan was not the first waste business that, uh, that uh, made its way to Spectacle Island. The first one was since the 1850s, and some of you may know this, uh, the, the Ward Company, that uh, basically recycled dead horses and cows. And all these waste businesses were a symptom of the way that uh, the city was using the, its harbor islands at the time, uh, basically since the mid-19th century. And that was as a dumping ground for materials that the city didn't want uh, within its limits, that it wanted to push out of the way. This uh, is another image of the garbage plant. Uh, so, so yeah, this is spectacle looking north. Um, so, so just, just that you have an idea how, how, how big this factory actually was. Um, 
These uses uh, go back to uh, the way Boston developed during the 19th century, uh, because throughout the 19th century, Boston was growing explosively. And when I say explosively, I mean it. Uh, it was in 1810, Boston had 34,000 people. Eight years later, in 1890, uh, there were half a million. Uh, this, the population just goes through the roof. And this large concentration of people, of course, creates huge amounts of waste of all kinds. And waste that's unwelcome for sanitary reasons in the city proper. So, it's, uh, so Boston looks for ways how to get rid of this. And one way uh, that they find is to push it out on the Harbor Islands, not only on spectacle. Uh, so spectacle receives the, the household garbage and the dead animals. Uh, but uh, the largest problem, of course, is the sewage. And you all know that uh, succession of Harbor Islands uh, was used as sites for, for sewage treatment plants. The first one was Moon Island, and succeeded in the 50s by Nut Island, and then later on by Deer Island, where, as you all know, the, the, the sewage treatment plant still stands. So in this time, the water expanse between the islands and the city is interpreted as separating the two. And most people in Boston seem to draw a mental line or a dividing line between the city and the islands. So the city is supposed to become a clean, healthy, sanitary environment, and the islands are the place that receives all that's supposedly dirty, unwanted, undesirable, or unhealthy. And they're not really counted as part of the city. So they become Boston's, well, the ultimate urban fringe. Population, of course, doesn't always work uh, along the lines. It's, I mean, hmm. The line between the islands and the city is, is easy to draw on paper, but much more hard, much more hard to maintain in reality. So Spectacle Island is a case in point here because uh, although the garbage plant is located in Spectacle, uh, the, and so it's theoretically separate from the city, it's still very much present in the surrounding communities because it creates a horrible stench that traverses the water and basically comes back to, to, to bite the people who created the garbage in the first place. <laughs> uh, I, I can't get it into that now, but um, so while these unsavory uses push the islands mentally away from the city, uh, at the same time, they draw the islands ever deeper into Boston's urban infrastructure and into the functioning of the city, into its metabolism of the city as a body. Uh, islands are not perceived as such, they're really attached more closely than ever at this time, uh, because they're really possible to the city's functioning because they receive things that are undesirable, but necessary for the city to function. And they're also physically attached to the, to the city's body. Uh, some of them by more subtle means, such as power lines or water supply, others by, by, by causeways, bridges, or fill. So perceived as, as remote by Bostonians at this point, the islands become during this time really an integral part of Boston in their function. And they do reflect the city's development and its needs, while at the same time they, they represent its, let's say, dark, unsavory side. Islands as dumping grounds continues until mid 20th century. But after that, some of these uses are abandoned and 
a new way of thinking about how the islands takes over. Um, this next image. Uh, that, and we move forward into the 1960s. And the structure you see was called Water Plaza. And it was the centerpiece of the design for an international exposition in Boston or Expo that was planned for 1976. So the Expo pavilions would have been built uh, at Columbia Point at, and Thompson Island and on floating platforms in between. And the design included both the pavilions for the exposition and a so-called community of the future or new community. And it was a plan that was supposed to solve um, or tackle problems that Boston shared with other cities all over the world, uh, such as urban sprawl, traffic congestion, uh, race segregation, social inequality. And the idea was to build a new community in the harbor for 50,000 people. And as I said, it would, been, it would have been built parking floating platforms uh, of the harbor, and it would have been in a. <laughs> okay. I'm reminded of the time. <laughs> so uh, this, this community would have been a mixed income community with no cars allowed. So uh, it, would, it would have relied on public transport and on pedestrian walkways. And there was also a focus on, on, on integrating open space into this. And this uh, is Thompson Island, uh, partly covered. And of course, this looks dated, but <laughs> uh, partly covered by, by environmental control dome for uh, year round outdoors activities such as picnicking. But uh, Thompson Island was really supposed to serve as, as a open space area, as, as a park for this community mostly and provide rec rec recreational opportunities. And um, as you all know, uh, the expo was never built, but uh, the plans for it were a sign of a really radical rethinking of the Boston Harbor Islands and the role they played for the city. And to understand how this happened, uh, we need to look at what's happening in Boston uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, because in the late 1950s, Boston is a city on the brink of bankruptcy. Um, it has lost 100,000 people to the suburbs, who of course took their taxes with them. So the city's tax base is strong and the urban core is perceived as run down and dilapidated. So, Boston City Administration perceives that it's, it's, it basically has a city in crisis on its hands. And it needs to look for ways to make the city more attractive to businesses and well to the residents uh, who would bring their taxes with them. So the expo and the new community are part of this plan to, or part of this effort to, of the city to reinvent itself. Uh, to build a new and better Boston. And in this case, the Harbor Islands and the Harbor itself are interpreted as resources that can make the city more attractive. Basically as vacant space uh, that Boston could and eventually would expand into. Is that would allow the city to renew itself and there are many plans. This, this, this is just one of the plans how to do that. Uh, there are plans to build residential communities on, on several of the islands. There are plans to build a second airport at the Brewsters, which probably wasn't the best idea. <laughs> and one of these plans uh, was building the expo in the new community on, on Thompson Island, Columbia Point. 
So this time, this, the city doesn't push the islands away. Uh, quite on the contrary, as, as the older dumping ground uses would. Uh, at this point, it counts on incorporating them into Boston. It draws them closer. And this approach basically interprets the islands as, as, as Boston's sort of useful appendages. Uh, as a projection screen of the city's plans for its future. Um, when initiatives like the Expo um, try to attach Boston Harbor Islands firmly to Boston, People who saw the islands in a different light, as places apart and as places in their own right. And the most influential of them was this gentleman, Edward Rose Snow, and who most of you might be familiar with. Uh, he's the author of popular books about the Atlantic coast in general and about the Boston Harbor in particular. And here he's pictured leading a boat trip uh, uh, in, in Boston Harbor sometime in the 1960s, judging from the outfits. And, <laughs> and this, this was obviously staged. Let's just look at the map because his audience can't even see this map because he's just holding a turn to the photographer. But nevertheless, he did lead boat trips like this every Sunday morning during the 60s and 70s. And so just a bit about him. Here he is on, on a poster for one of his lectures. Edward Rose Snow was born in 1902 in Winthrop. And after a brief career as a, as, as a high school teacher, he basically devoted his life to lecturing and writing about his life on passion which was uh, the Atlantic coast and, and especially the Boston Harbor Islands. <clears throat> Lectures, hosted a radio show, uh, had newspaper columns in the Patriot Ledger and in the Boston Herald. Uh, and above all, during his life, he published nearly 100 books uh, on the subject of the New England coast. As I mentioned, his special, and as you, most know, his special focus was on Boston Harbor. And his book, uh, The Islands of Boston Harbor, was first published in 1925 and came out uh, in two subsequent editions. Uh, the last one is from 2002. So for generations of, le of, of readers and listeners, he became the most authoritative voice on the subject. And the stories he told about the islands cast them in a very different light from what we've heard so far. For him, these islands were places of mystery and romance. He told the history of the islands as, 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 as a series of thrilling adventures that typically involved shipwrecks and terrible storms, miraculous rescues, ghosts, pirates, and chests of gold. You get the idea. Um, this is just an image from, uh, I think it's from the secrets of the North Atlantic Islands. And this, yeah, so, so this, this illustrates nicely what I'm talking about. It's like the, the Atlantic coast for him is, 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 is a stage of and ghosts and, and gold and jewels and so so it's all very exciting not necessarily true but <laughs> but this so this, so this shows the the, the Atlantic coast as, as, as such but uh, uh, he did the same thing for the Boston Harbor Islands of course and there was, there was a dramatic adventure story to each island in his narrative. So 
the eroded island to Nix's mate, we've talked about before, was the setting of a pirate story. Lovell's Island for him was a treasure island where gold pieces from an old shipwreck were found. And George's Island before Warren even had this resident ghost, the lady in black. <laughs> and so all this was in line with traditional portrayal violence as remote, mysterious, isolated, and very extraordinary. And, and really unusual uh, about this was that Edward Rose Snow extended this imagination to the Boston Harbor Islands, which up to that point were not really seen as romantic or mysterious, and certainly not as remote. And they were home to very mundane and decidedly unromantic uses, such as landfills and sewage plants. So the islands caught on. He was a very popular author, an influential public figure, and he seemed to tap into Bostonians' desire to, to escape their everyday city life every once in a while. Uh, into a world of adventure and romance uh, that the islands promised. And his activities caused the Boston public to see their islands in a new light, to really reimagine uh, them as places apart, as places out of the ordinary, uh, that had their, their own rich histories. And although the exciting anecdotes he, he told about them didn't really reflect their, their actual historical development. Uh, they, these stories help establish the islands, as, as I said, as places in their own right, as they were no longer just Boston's appendages, but places that had their own histories and places that should be enjoyed and protected. Uh, this is, however, only one part of the story of how the Boston Harbor Islands uh, got to look and be perceived the way they are now, just as a valuable natural and cultural heritage. And this part of the story has a lot to do with uh, these young women and one young man. And I'm sorry that uh, Suzanne Goldmarsh isn't, isn't here today in person, but I hope she's watching online and she's enjoying this. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, those of you who know her recognize her, probably. That's, that's her. And the picture dates from uh, 1979 and was taken on Gallops Island. Now, Gallops, as most other harbor islands, has a history of fringe uses that goes back to the 19th century. It served as a site of Boston's quarantine hospital uh, and since, since the 1860s. And during the Second World War, there was a military radio school. And after, after that, uh, after these uses were abandoned, Allen served occasionally as a site for burning trash. So all in all, not a very appealing place, one, one could say. But uh, these young people did see it as such. Um, so the 1970s, of course, are the so-called environmental decade, a time of growing environmental aware awareness or, or growing environmental concern, I should say of the first encompassing environmental legislation, uh, a time when, for instance, the EPA was founded. So, so these young people were the first generation who saw the Boston Harbor Islands uh, as an endangered ecosystem and as a natural resource that should be valued and protected. And this picture is significant for two reasons. First, the people in it embody uh, first government initiative to protect the Boston Harbor Islands uh, and to turn them into a recreational area for Boston. So 
as you might know, in 1970, uh, several of the Boston Harbor Islands were declared a state park. And these people are, as the sign says, these people are island managers. So employed by the State Department of Environmental Management uh, to act as park rangers on these islands. So in, in, the, in the usual manner of, of park rangers, so to greet visitors, to introduce them to the island's uh, nature and history, and to clean up after them. So this, this is both grew out of and contributed to a change in the public image of, of, the, of the Boston Harbor Islands. So from, from abandoned places and former dumping grounds, they, they've suddenly turned into places where you would go for leisure and for a break from the city. And second, secondly, what's, what's, what's significant or what's important about this picture is that most of these people are involved with uh, nonprofits that are focusing on the harbor. Uh, I mean, most, 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 most of the people in the picture were in some way or another involved with the friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. Um, active in, in promoting an image of the Boston Harbor Islands places where nature and history met, and that would be best used for recreation and environmental education. Most of them were familiar with the stories uh, that Edward Rose Snow told about the islands, and went on to be, to be instrumental in the process of establishing the National Park or the National Recreation Area in Boston Harbor that came to be in, in 96. Also the way we see the islands today as places with both natural and cultural heritage and as open space for Boston. Just, these are just images I pulled from uh, the National Park's Facebook. Um, so, so you can see that it's really a combination of both. It has the lighthouse, it has the Fort Warren on George's Island, but it also has nature walks and, and the wildlife that uh, you can encounter when you go out on the water. I tried to do in this talk was to, and I hope I succeeded, was to take you on a journey through the history of the Boston Harbor Islands and show you how the islands became what they are today. Of course, this was a simplified version and, and I now for self-promotion, if you want a full, ver full version, I can refer to the book. <laughs> but uh, maybe one thing in conclusion. Although, on the one hand, the way we use the islands and the way we look at them has changed significantly over time. So I mean, you can see the, 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 the art from labor to leisure or, or from, from work to play, if you will, one thing has stayed the same. The islands have always been subject to Bostonians' perceptions and needs. So according to what the city needed them to be, they were pastures, dumping grounds, building space, and today they are a recreational area. So over there, shared history in Boston, they have been, and they remain an urban archipelago. Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, is, is there a specific question about, about uh, or is it just about the indigenous? Mm -hmm. uh, I was mostly focusing on Spectacle Island and uh, from what I think uh, are typical of the of 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 of, of most of the Harbor Islands, so they would be even yeah. It actually it actually supports my thesis because 
even by the by the indigenous people, these islands would be uh, yeah, would have would have actually fringe uses because that so they were used by the indigenous people, but uh, there was next to no year-round habitation, uh, as far as I know. I mean, close to the to the to the to the contact period there would be some agricultural hamlets on, on some of the islands but the typical use would be seasonal uh, seasonal camps for mostly harvesting uh, harvesting marine animals so so for harvesting fish and clams there's there's middens on several of the islands that, that have been uncovered so yeah so that's that's the one thing. That's the pre-contact history, and of course, then there's the much less happy history of Deer Island, uh, which I know some of you are probably familiar with this history. But uh, do, yeah, so so during King Philip's War, uh, several hundred of the of of, of indigenous people from the so-called praying towns. So, uh, so basically, basically Native Americans who converted to Christianity uh, were seen as untrustworthy and would be would be interned on their island, which at this point and over winter, which at this point would be in basically a prison camp. Um, so the conditions would be extremely harsh. There wouldn't be enough food. So, uh, or assume that uh, several several hundreds of several hundred of them actually died of exposure and hunger. And but this is also reflected in in the way the National Park Service manages the park today. So they are, as far as I'm aware. Uh, when they did the general management plan, they were talking to the indigenous communities about how to get, go about this heritage. So. Uh, <laughs> yes, they were thinking about it. And um, in fact, Olmsted was, was actively involved in this. He uh, even gave, gave a lecture to uh, to the Boston Park, to the Boston Park Department, advocating or arguing for uh, the Harbor Islands to be uh, to be included in in, in the Boston uh, system of public spaces. Although the most important figure uh, in this particular campaign isn't so much Olmsted as rather Charles Elliot. Until his untimely death, uh, was uh, was really a great advocate for uh, for the inclusion of these islands uh, into into the system of 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 of, of Boston's public spaces. And I to remember a quote from from him that says that Boston has the good. Thing probably, but that Boston has the good fortune to be lo located between two great wildernesses, and one of them is the Boston Harbor. And mm -hmm. um, that Bostonians would be stupid indeed not to make use of this and not to preserve this great open space for future generations and not to use it as open space. <clears throat> Fortunately, he was, was unsuccessful at the time. Uh, in designating this as, as a public park. But uh, when the national park uh, was established in 1996, nine, 1996, uh, there actually, there, there was a lot of, yeah. So in the, in, yeah, in the feasibility study for the park, uh, if they recalled, like, to, yeah. So, so Charles Eli was sort of a patron saint of the park because they, 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 they try to reflect that they're sort of their, they're sort of yeah, continuing his work, so to speak. That's 
was this, yeah, so this was the idea of the create landscape architect, which we are now putting, putting into practice and finally this is happening. So, so this, this was the case in the late 19th century and, and it has lived on until the late 20th century. Uh, one of the one of the images that I just showed. So, so so the historical maps of Boston Harbor were terrific resources, and so the, so the Boston Public Library, uh, the 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 Leventhal Map Center, uh, is is really great because as an environmental historian, you don't you don't just look at uh, written documents, you, you need to imagine what the landscape actually looked like. And these are invaluable sources really for this. Uh, also, the friends of the Boston Harbor Islands, I was very fortunate to uh, be able to profit from, from um, the Suzanne Golmarsh's records. Um, Therefore, be able to reconstruct not only not only the mm, point of not only the sort of top-down history, so the point of view of, of governmental agencies, but also uh, sort of the the, the, the grassroots level. Uh, so the nonprofits, which were incredibly important in Boston Harbor. We have a few questions. People are asking about. <laughs> Future of the island uh, with climate change, and if they're getting the resources. Uh, and if, if what? And if they're getting the support and resources they need to survive. Well, as a historian, I'm ill equipped to answer questions about the future. <laughs> but uh, so. I'm aware that uh, there was this uh, there was this study a couple of years ago uh, about use about potentially using the islands uh, in climate change mitigation for Boston. Like, and some of you may be familiar with this, like building this giant barrier across the harbor, which would use the islands. Uh, and I I can't really speak to the science of that. Uh, to me, it's uh, interesting in the way that uh, Boston is basically continuing this, this way of thinking about the islands, that they're really useful appendages of the city. So and if Boston has a problem, then the islands can somehow solve it. <laughs> um, uh, on 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 the other part of the question, uh, so as a historian, I can't really answer that, but as a private person, I'm, I'm thrilled to see so much activity in the harbor. And uh, there are so many nonprofits and so many people who are actually actively involved and they are concerned about the harbor. Uh, and they're absolutely on the right track and doing a great work. So. <laughs> For the question, I I didn't manage to pack this into the talk, but uh, that's I, that's actually what I hope to do with my book. That uh, on the example of Boston, because as you say, Boston is a coastal city with adjacent islands, but all across the all along the North American coast uh, are similar cities. I mean, look at New York look at Baltimore, look at San Francisco. Uh, I mean, even cities that aren't located on, on the coast like Montreal has made very similar use of its islands. So the, big, the bigger picture, I, I hope to speak, to speak to with my book that uh, urban islands may be uh, their own separate category and that if you look uh, at other cities as well that then then patterns emerge 
that these islands are used in very specific ways that are similar to one another across North America and possibly across the world. So yes, I definitely think that, that uh, there's a specific category of place that really deserves to be, to be looked at more closely.